amen. Good morning to you. Man, you guys picked the right day to be here. You got all kinds of cool stuff going on. Baptisms, Lord's Supper, and ordinations. If you would, stand your feet and let's praise the Lord. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing time? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces? Side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? All your garments spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the You're walking daily by the Savior's side. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you reach each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless or they? White as snow, are you washed in the blood of the land? Spotless are they, white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? One more time. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless are they, white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Somebody say amen. Hey, you can be seated. Glad you're here to worship with us today. Uh, if you're watching online and you're sitting in the service, uh, let us know that you're a part of what God's doing today. If you're watching online, you can go to our webpage and just uh, hit the guest tab on bfchurch.com. If you're here in the service, there's one of these little cards in the seat back that's probably in front of you. You can grab one of those. And at the end of the service, Pastor Tim will be out in the lobby and love to meet you personally on your way out. But for whatever reason you're here for, we are glad that you're here to worship with us today. This is going to be an exciting day in the Lord. We have uh, six folks who are going to get baptized. We have communion service. We have an ordination service. So you might just call this ordinance and praise Sunday. Amen? But as we go through this, let me just say a, a quick word about the Lord's Supper. We are not a church that practices what is called closed communion. What that means, if a church practices closed communion, that means if you're not a member of their church, you can't take communion with them. Uh, if the only legitimate requirement we have for you taking Lord's Supper is really that you know the Lord. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're more than welcome to celebrate in communion with us. Uh, if you're a child of God, this is something that Jesus told us to do often as we do it in remembrance of him. So everything we do, obviously, is wants to be a remembrance of the Lord. But regarding Lord's Supper Day, you are welcome uh, to receive it. It's up to you, your choice. As, as when we pass out the elements today, you're invited to take with us. All right? But we are glad that you're here today. Brother Tim, where are you? Well, let's, let's, let's baptize some folks, well, I amen? I thought we were going to welcome guests. I thought we were welcome. Do All what? Right. I did. Okay, I thought we were going to do a walk around. So. Amen. Well, this is always one of my favorite things to do as a pastor is to baptize. And so we praise the Lord today that we've got uh, six people that uh, have committed to Christ that want to follow the Lord by his command. So uh, anyway, we'll start with Tim. Why don't you go and come on up and... Uh, Amen. 
Tim, have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and committed to follow Him for all the days of your life? Yes. Then it's my pleasure as your brother in Christ to baptize you. So uh, on behalf of the Lord and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ's death. <laughs> raised in the power of His resurrection. Amen, brother. And we'll get his wife, Unju, and she'll come. Finally, the Lord got her back from Korea to be part of our fellowship, so we praise the Lord that God got her here safely. And All right. Well, Unju, have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're committed to follow him all the days of your life? Yes, I am. Then it's my pleasure to baptize you, my little sister. And we do that in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ's death. Raised in the power of His resurrection. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Pepe, if you'll come next. And uh, good to have Pepe and Carol as they've come to be part of our fellowship. Blessing to have them as well. Pepe, have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and are you committed for all the days of your life to follow Him each and every day? Yes, I am. And it's my privilege to baptize you. So, uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, my brother. Amen. Amen. Carol, if you'll come now, good to be baptizing husband and wives together and the they Carol, have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and are committed to Him to follow Him as your Lord and Savior all the days of your life? Yes, I do. Then it's my pleasure to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, baptized in Christ's death, raised in the power of His resurrection. <laughs> All right, Miss Jan. Ask you that same question. Have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you're committed for all the days of your life to follow Him? Yes, so long. Amen. Amen. And it's my pleasure to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary in Christ's death, raised in the power of His resurrection. Amen, sister. All right, Chloe, you're over there by yourself. So we're, we're going to let you get baptized last. All right. Well, Chloe, it's, I know you received the Lord in there in my office, and I know it was a great event, and so now you're following the Lord in baptism. So I'm going to ask you that same question you were asking my office. Have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're ready to follow Jesus all the days of your life? Happy to baptize. She's ready. <laughs> She's ready Amen. to follow Jesus. So it's my privilege to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary to Christ's death. Raised in the power of his resurrection. Amen. 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 All right. Brother Terry. Amen. Please stand. We'll continue with our worship service. Let us not lift our souls to wonder. 
Amen. You may be seated. As I say, we are celebrating different ordinances of the church today, but let me read you a passage out of 1 Peter 5. It says this, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, and not as lording it over to those that are allotted to your charge, but proving to be an example to the flock. There's a passage here and in many other places where it addresses elders in the body of Christ. A lot of people have different ideas about the governance of the church, but we've always set out from the very beginning at Believer's Fellowship, from the very first days we were founded, to set up our church structure in a New Testament order, uh, not according to the fashion of men or denomination or whatever, but what does the Bible say? And the Bible talks about those who exercise governance of the church, and those we just read about is the word elder. It's used a lot of places interchangeably. There's different Greek words in, in the scriptures. In other places, translated presbyter. In other places, there's a translation for, for episkopos. But many times, they're all translated to the same English word. It's people who exercise oversight who, over the, in the body of Christ. All of us are important. All of us have gifts. All of us have a place. But there are certain ministry callings as well for each of us. Uh, today, we are going to be ordaining as one of our newest elders of the church, Terry Colburn. So I'm going to ask Terry and Tim and uh, Gary, Ronnie, some of our elders, Terry as well. I'm going to ask them to come and come on, Terry, we don't bite. You guys, if we just, uh, just kneel here. And as you guys just begin to pray over them, if the Lord leads you, let me just share a little, a little bit, another, another passage of Scripture with everyone, but you go ahead and begin to pray for him. Whether it was deacons or whether it was elders or whatever office it was in the church, it's the responsibility of the church leaders to lay hands upon them and commit them to the ministry and to pray for them in ministry. In Ephesians, Paul is writing to the elders of the church, and he's talking to them about their responsibility and their oversight and their care for the body. In verse 28 of, in Ephesians, it, um, in Acts, Paul said, Be careful, attention, pay attention to yourselves, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. Your responsibility is to care for the church of God. There he calls them overseers. So there's nothing that makes anybody any better than anybody else. We always remember that the church, we are all one in Christ. And just because somebody has a role or a ministry or a certain gift doesn't make them any better than anybody else in the church. The ground around the cross of Jesus is equal. But we do have a responsibility to recognize those. We've watched Terry's life and his commitment going on 15 years in this church as a, as a servant of the Lord, serving God in so many different areas of ministry. Whatever we seem to ask Terry to do, he was always ready to stand up and step up and be that man that God called him to be. So we lay our hands on him and recognition of his faithfulness to the Lord and meeting the qualifications that are laid out in Scripture in Titus and other places in the Word of God. Amen. So I'd ask you as we're praying, you would also just bow your head for a moment and, and pray with us. I'll close us in a word of prayer with this. Father, we thank you for your grace. I thank you for the life of Terry and for all these men who serve you so willingly. I pray you continue to guide his heart and guide his mind. And as you place him in this particular office, Lord, as you give him this particular ministry, that he would continue to seek your face for the wisdom that he needs. Lord, uh, deliver us from self-opinion. Help us to be listening to you and paying attention to your Holy Spirit and being, staying true to your words so that we know when you're speaking is, is, is not based on something that is our will, but your will in our lives. So continue to guard him, continue to guide him, protect his life, his home, his family. Use each of them for your glory. But we dedicate this man to you and thank you that you've dedicated him to the body of Christ here. Use him for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Praise God. You can remain seated. Have a good We come to this part of the service. I just want to remind you a few things. Jesus said, you know, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. 
And it's important that when we do receive the Lord's Supper and commune together, that we understand that this is an act of remembering what the Lord has done, remembering him, remembering. And literally when it talks about that, it is a word which Jesus used very emphatically to the disciples in the upper room. It, it meant you need, to, you need to shut everything down for a moment in your heart and mind and get your heart and your mind focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Fix your attention on him. We use a, we use a word meditate many times in, in Scripture, but it is, it's a unique word in, in the Word of God. It has to do with really remembering something, recalling something. It comes from a word which we, we use in agricultural terms when it talks about cows ruminating their food. You know, they have multiple stomachs, you know, so a, a cow will chew something, swallow it, and then bring it back up, chew it some more and swallow it, and does that several times until it goes on to the, to the next stomach. Now, that might seem a bit gross for you, but the idea is that, hey, this is not just something you do in passing. This is something you need to take your time on, and every time we observe the Lord's Supper, we should be remembering just how holy it is and what a picture it is to our salvation. It doesn't sanctify us, but it does give us a clear picture of all that the Lord has done, and it gives us a clear picture how about we should honor him as he has sacrificed for us. In verse 26, Jesus said, uh, Paul was writing the church at Corinth in verse 26, chapter 11. He says, you know, as often as you do this, he said, you proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. Basically saying, every time you share this, it should be a picture of everything that Jesus has done for you in dying for your sins, presenting his body, shedding his blood, and what he's done there. And also, he said, it's a message. It's a proclamation that what we're doing here is a sermon in pictures, and we should proclaim it. And I like to say, until, I, until he comes back. And I believe with all my heart that he's coming back. So how, how do we do that? I think, first of all, it, 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 it's remembering who he is. If you've ever taken a journalism class, uh, they, they ask you to, you know, in, in, in studying something, researching something, it was the, the five W's, you know. Uh, it's who, what, when, where, why. And I think that's the way I just want to look at this this morning. Remember who he is. You say, well, who is he? He's the son of God. He declared himself that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He's the door, the Bible says. He's the gate. He's the shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He's the word of God. Scripture declares him to be the alpha and the omega, calls him the high priest, another place, the king of kings, the Lord of all, the master. He's called savior. He's called deliverer. He's called the prince of peace. He's called the son of God. He's called the son of man. He's called the son of David. He's called the counselor. He's the true vine. I am the resurrection, he said. I am Emmanuel. I am Messiah. I am Redeemer. He is Jesus. He is peace. He's love. He's grace. He's joy. He's salvation. So in remembering this today, let's take a moment just to remember just who we're talking about and who we're remembering. But also remember what he did. He left heaven to be born in a human body through the birth of a virgin. The Bible says in 2 he bore our sins, it says in 1 Peter. On the tree, on the cross, he, he became our sins. He took our place. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. So when we're remembering this, we're remembering the death of Jesus Christ, the death that paid for our sins, the death that paid for my sins. You can seek to be the best person from this day forward the rest of your life, but that still won't pay the price. The Bible says that we need a redeemer. He is our redeemer. He took your place. He shed his blood at Calvary for us. He conquered death forever for us. He ascended back to heaven, and he's coming back again. So what did he do? He ransomed. He redeemed. He paid the price for it. But remember why he did it. And we can clearly draw just two quick observations from Scripture. One, many of you are familiar with him, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what's the qualification for salvation? It's me putting my faith in Jesus Christ. He did it because of love. Bottom line, for God so loved the world. Now, that's a pretty general, bald term. But I believe if you study Scripture long enough, you begin to see the uniqueness and the individuality of that. You say, what do you mean? That he died for you, that he loves you, that he knows you. In fact, it says the very hairs on their head are numbered. He knows you, and he did it because he loved you. The Bible tells us very clearly it was God's love that sent Jesus to the cross. But also, why? 
because we needed a Savior. First reason is love. The second reason was sin. When sin entered into the world, it entered into the cosmos and entered in because of one man's disobedience into the heart of every person who's ever born. The Bible says we are all sinners because of one man's sin. But the one man, the God man, Jesus Christ, comes to save us so that we can be made righteous. So God gives us this great gift of his son. And he, his son goes to the cross, as I said a while ago in 2 Corinthians, the Bible says God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. In other words, he took your sin. Everything you'd ever done wrong, everything that's ever been wrong, everything you've ever said wrong, everything that you were wrong, he took it upon himself and became that so you might be made right with God. But also remember who he did it for. Who did he do it for? He did it for me. You say, that's a bit selfish, isn't it? <laughs> he did it for you as well. And for us to ignore that or to deny that is to miss the very reason that we were created. I was created, you were created with purpose in mind. And that purpose is to have a relationship with your creator. And your creator is God the Father and Son, Jesus Christ. And so he, he came and he died to reunite me and to reunite you to him. Unfortunately, too many people don't realize that, nor do they understand it. And they simply walk around through their life and just forget him. But he hasn't forgotten you. Every time you have a stirring in your heart to come to the Lord, to get right with God, or to give your life to Christ, that's the Holy Spirit and God's mercy and his compassion drawing you and calling you, and you need to respond to that because there will come a day when the Bible says our hearts can get hard. But also remember when he did it. You say, well, I know that. The history teaches us very clear when he did it. You can go ahead and click that next button for me, please. When he did it was 2,000-plus years ago, right? Well... I'm not talking about when historically that he did it, but I mean, when did he do it for you? Well, he did it that many years. Yeah, but when did you receive that gift? You know, every gift that can be committed still has to be taken and still has to be open. I, I, and I think it's our responsibility to realize what God's done, but God's not going to force that upon you. You're going to have to make a decision. Just as everyone who went to those baptismal waters said, I haven't made a decision, I'm going to follow Jesus. And the invitation is here today from Jesus. You, you can still follow him. I remember when he did it in my life. I remember the date as well as the day. You say, well, I don't remember the day, but I remember the day. And I believe if that's ever happened in your life, you'll remember the day. It, it's, it's a big moment. It's a moment when you realize, hey, I need something more than myself. I, I have a need in my life. I can't save myself. I can't justify myself. I can't redeem myself. And church membership won't do it. Even baptism doesn't do it. I need the Father, and I make a personal decision to give my heart and to give my life to Jesus Christ. When did that take place? I remember the day. I remember the date. Now, some of you say, well, you know, I'm not sure I remember the day, D-A-T-E, but I remember the day. Sometimes we can forget dates. You know, you might forget the date of the, you were married on. I advise you not to do that. <laughs> You may need a little nudge and reminding, but I'll tell you what, I'll never forget the day I was married. Just clear my mind is everything else in my life is, has clarity to it. That is clear, clear as a bell. I remember the day when I saw her walk down that aisle. I remember the day we took hands and we looked at each other. We made those covenant vows to one another. I remember that day clearly. I remember the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. If you can't come to a place that, well, there's never really been that in my life. Why not? Because it's a relationship, salvation is. It's a, it's a time you say yes to Jesus. Just like when you get married, you're yes to this other person. Now, I have this commitment to, the, to my father through his son, and I have this relationship. So, do you remember when? And now, you say, well, I don't know. Well, then make it today. All right? What is it, August the 27th? Is that today? See, I'm not sure about today's date. <laughs> today, at 932. <laughs> Right here and now, you can say yes to Christ and say, listen, I'm not going to follow my old ways, my old life anymore. It's a turnout and a turnaround for me. I'm going to follow Christ. Invite Christ in your life. The last thing I want to make a point about this before we receive this is remember the right way to remember. You say, what do you mean? Paul said he had instruction from the Lord on how to receive the Lord's Supper. He said we should do it with a heart that's right. He said, you know, we, we shouldn't come to the Lord's table. We shouldn't take communion together if our hearts 
are still filled with disobedience. And it's possible to be a Christian, to know Christ, and still not be really obeying him in your life. This table represents all that Jesus has done for us. If we come and receive the Lord's Supper, and we're not willing to get our hearts and lives right, but what a slam, what a slap that is to everything that this represents. So I encourage you as a Christian, if there are things that are not right in your heart today, Paul said we should judge ourselves. What's that mean? You've got to be honest with yourself. We're going to have a, t a time just to pray here in just a moment, and that would be the time for you to get your heart right. Say, listen, Father, I, I want to have a heart that's right. I, I do want to remember the right way to remember and get my life right and get my heart right with you. It's an opportunity for you to, you say, well, it can't be that easy. It is that easy because all the work has been done by Jesus Christ. Everything needs to be done for you to get right, to be right, to walk right has already been taken care of. It's time for you to kick your will in motion and say yes to the Lord and begin to follow him. Amen? So who did, what he did, why he did it, who he did it for, when he did it, and let's remember the right way to be holy. If we would judge ourselves, the Bible said, we would not be chastened of the Lord. So let's, let's get our hearts right. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head with me before we receive this. You can go ahead and stand with me just for a moment if you would. Fathers, we come to this table today. We want to have hearts that are, that are right with you, lives that are right with you. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move through this assembly right now and speak to us each uniquely and individually as you do. Let's just open our hearts to the Father in this moment, can you? Just excuses out the window, resistance gone. Just say yes to the Lord today. If you've never committed your life to Christ, this is a great moment for you to say yes to the Lord Jesus. Father, I am not going to walk away from you anymore. Here's my heart. Here's my life. Just ask him to forgive you of your sins. Come into your life. Say, from this moment on, Lord, you're in first place, not me. It's called repentance and faith in Scripture. A choice against yourself and a choice for him. Make that decision today. For Christians, the Bible says if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just. If there's something in your heart, you know, the Lord's been speaking about, put it on the altar right now. Say, Lord, forgive me. And then be specific with him. Lord, forgive me for, wash me, cleanse me. Father, you're a gracious God, and in our hearts and in our lives, there's no place I don't think that any of us could ever brag and say we deserve what you've done for us, because we do not. You were willingly subjected to violence, brutality, torture, and nailed to a cross like a common thief. And it should have been us. But Lord, as we approach this time of communion, wash us clean. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Those of you who will be serving today, I'd ask you to come forward this time. The Bible says in the night that Jesus was betrayed he took bread we're going to pass this bread out amongst you today and i want to ask you it's in a little self-serve cup to just take it and hold it for a moment as we pass out the elements tray comes by just take one and pass it to the next person pass it to the next person and then we'll pray together over it all right so gentlemen if you'll serve them Transgression, crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. He was pierced for our transgression and crushed for our sin. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice, 
and the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price. By your grace, we are saved. We are saved. He was pierced for our transgression and crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. By your grace, we are saved. We are of bread you hold it's uh it's called matzah bread it's passover bread when passover is prepared that bread had to be prepared in just the way that little piece of bread you're holding is had to be prepared without any yeast in scripture yeast represents sin uh, we all know that yeast is a chemical has a chemical reaction when it's placed in dough it causes the heat causes it to rise the temperature can cause it to rise basically just makes hot air inside bread. Well, there's no hot air inside Jesus, all right? He's pure through and through. There, there's no vacuum that needs to be filled in his life. The Bible says he is complete and whole, the Son of God, and he comes to make us complete and whole. When he took that bread, it says he broke it and he passed it amongst his apples. This is the type. It was probably a large piece that he broke off and handed to them. And he said, this is my body. This represents my body. That body without sin. In fact, it had to be cooked in a certain way. It had to be poked in, in, uh, in, in a way. And it had to be placed upon a grill so that when it was done, you could see the holes and you could see the stripe marks representing the precious body of Jesus Christ who was pierced on our behalf, who was crushed, who was wounded, who bore our stripes, it says in Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. So as we take this bread today, we represent... All that is the body of Christ, his love, his grace, his purity, his wholeness, his completeness. And we celebrate what he's done for us. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving over that bread right now. And you can pray yourself if you'd like, just thanking the Lord. But then we'll take and eat at that after I pray. Father, as we lift this bread up to you today, we thank you for this gift that you've given us of your life and your body. That you actually just presented yourself. That you went, as scripture tells us, like a sheep to slaughter, that you took that whip on your back and the nails in your hand and the spear in your side and the thorns on your brow. You were pierced for our transgressions. You were wounded and bruised and crushed for us. So when we take this bread today, we take it in remembrance of you, Jesus. We thank you for all you've done for us and the life you give us because of giving your body for us. In Jesus' name, would you take and eat? We'll... The Bible says in like manner that Jesus took the cup. We're going to do the same, pass this cup out amongst you and ask you to just reflect on all the Lord's done by shedding his blood for your sin and saving us. You pass it out and and we'll pray together and receive it together.
Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart grow weak. It was there about faith I received my sight. Now I am happy of the day. Blessed did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. He devoted that sacred head to a sinner such as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received. My son, and now I am happy all the day. All the day. All the day. All the day. When Jesus was on the cross, he'd already shed a lot of blood before he even got to Calvary began in the garden when he was praying and sweating great drops of blood, literally pouring out of him. The weight of the sin, the heaviness of that, incredible grossness of that in his mindset who knew no sin, then taking, being taken from place to place and being beaten and slapped around, eventually crowned with a crown of thorns, and a cross laid upon his back when he gets to Golgotha. Bible says he didn't have to be forced down. He laid down and said, no man takes my life from me, but I give it freely. Stretched out his hands to be nailed to that cross and his feet was raised up. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That cry comes from a heart that's been absolutely torn away from everything he knew that was right and righteous and holy and pure in heaven. Because in this moment, he's becoming our sin. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us, from the beginning in Genesis all the way then, without the shedding of blood, our sins can't be removed. It's a clear theme throughout Scripture. You, you can't pay for your own sins and, and have full payment. You just pay for eternity. But once you come to Christ, his blood is so, so, act, so, so full and so complete and so holy, it is, a, it is a, an acceptable offering for God's justice. And that's why we can come freely to know the Father, to know the Son, to give our heart and life to Him. So I pray that you remember the right, right way to remember this as you look down that cup and what this cup symbolizes. It symbolizes your salvation. On the cross, He declared it's finished, and then they took a spear and they ran it into His heart and literally ruptured it. The Bible says the water and the blood flowed out. Literally, He drained every last drop of blood that He had for me and for you. That's great love. Learn to appreciate that. Let's just bow our heads. And you personally, want you to say, thank the Lord for this gift he's given you. And then I'll lead us in prayer. Father, how we worship you today. We can't even imagine what must have been going on in heaven in this moment when your son is dying on the cross. How awestruck eternity must have been in that moment. The Lord, you knew this in the very beginning. You knew Adam would fail. You knew Eve would fail. You knew mankind would fail. And you devised a plan before time and eternity how to redeem us and how to save us. And even in the very first book of the Bible, you began to give us prophetic words that there would come a Savior, that Satan's head would be 
crushed, but the heel of the Savior would be bruised. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking that bruise for us. And we take this today. We do this in remembrance of you. The price you paid and the blood you shed. Father, if we never are able to do this again, this side of eternity, may this moment be impacted upon us by your Holy Spirit to see what we're doing here. This message of salvation, the cost of it, the beauty of your holiness. Lord Jesus, we take this today remembering you and loving you and thanking you for your grace. To you take and drink in remembrance of Jesus. The Lord Jesus did that with the disciples. You may be seated. He did that with the disciples in the upper room. Why don't we all just stand together, all right? You have another song we can sing or one thing with song we just sang? Let's stand and worship the Lord together. Amen. He was crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are here seated just to close out on a few notes on that high note of all that we got to experience today in Christ uh, first of all is our campus business meeting 
that is this Wednesday night and uh, at 7 o'clock. And this is a special called meeting as we discussed about the transition and the things we'll be going over. Uh, you'll have opportunity at this meeting to answer questions. We had it at the spring campus last Wednesday. And so uh, you can choose either one of two things. We have little question forms. Uh, they're on the offering boxes. If you'd rather write your question down, you can drop that in the offering box. Or we'll have a microphone on Wednesday night where you'll be able to ask uh, whatever question that you feel like you want to ask to give clarity and understanding so that we answer those questions that you have and be able to satisfy that. So uh, come Wednesday night, have your questions ready or have them written down, and we'll just have a glorious time together as we uh, meet together in unity. We're so blessed that our fellowship is so united in Christ, and we're just going to uh, allow that to happen and be blessed by it. Also, our leadership meeting, I uh, hope you have that on your calendar. If you serve in any capacity um, as a volunteer here to do anything for Christ, uh, you're invited to this meeting. Uh, it will be at 7 o'clock from 6.50 to about 7.15. We'll have some dessert back here in the uh, Fellowship Hall, and about 7.15 we'll meet here for that uh, meeting together. This will be both campuses. Both campuses will meet here at the... Uh, uh, Magnolia campus. So if you serve in any capacity at all, uh, make sure you mark it down to be here at 7 p.m. On that, on that day. Also, be sure to sign up for our upcoming Empower Marriage Conference. Uh, we've got Pastor Nick Harris coming from Dallas. Uh, we've got Pastor uh, Jason Nick coming to do uh, worship. It's going to be at the Hill Country at the Wild Ranch Hotel. Uh, we've had it there before and people just love it. It's a great time to get away and so we've got the early bird cost is set as low as we can there. It's two nights lodging, and that's a conference and one big banquet meal. And you'll have a great time. But we do need you to register, whether you register online, which you can do that, or there are some little forms out in the lobby and also some little handouts. Part of our conferences is not just to strengthen everybody's marriage, but it's also to use it as an outreach to invite people to say, hey, we're having this conference, and so you can pass those out as well. And there's a little QR code where it goes straight to all the information, all the details on the website. But you can also fill out a form, put your deposit down, and we'll save a room for you. So uh, we believe each year that this is important because the lives of marriages, we see that day in and day out, and doing what we can to do to empower and strengthen marriages for the future it has lasting results not only for you and your life, not only for the life of the church, but the life of this nation. <laughs> I don't minimize that, you know, because so goes the home, so goes the nation many times. And so we want to make these opportunities that we can pour into the life of people. If you've never heard Pastor Nick Harris, you've been blessed. I think we've had him about, probably about six different conferences, and he just really brings that. He's so gifted here in this area, you're going to be blessed. So can't say it enough. Um, I know if you probably asked me and if you asked your wife, what do you think? She's probably going to say, I think we better sign up. Amen. <laughs> so may ask her what she thinks and uh, be able to, to do that as well. Also, to our first-time guests, uh, we're so glad that you came today and were part of our service and got to experience the baptism, the Lord's Supper, the ordination. Uh, you should have received a welcome card as you came in. If you didn't, as Brother Joe said, they're there in the pockets in front of you. Take that card with you if this is your very first time. I'll be out in the lobby. We have a gift that we'd like to personally give you and just greet you for a while, so don't run off. Stop by that table, and we'll be able to do that. And again, we hope you'll be back and be part of our service and be part of our fellowship. Uh, God's placed us here in Magnolia to reach out to this area, and maybe God's given you an opportunity to visit today, and you're saying, hey, this is where I believe God may have me. So come on back and be part of what God's doing here. Also, don't forget your tithes and offerings. Be faithful in your giving. We don't pass a plate here. We have offering boxes in the back, which we believe is part of our worship, uh, worship time that we also give unto the Lord as he's given to us. So you can see the various ways to give. But the key is just be faithful in your giving. Give and it shall be given unto you, not only uh, because it keeps the ministries going, but the, we can actually spread the word more as we have opportunities to be able to do that. So uh, just be faithful in your giving. Amen. You glad you came? 
Boy, you got to see it all today, amen, that uh, God's good, that we got to see a good sampler platter of all God's doing, and got to see all the ordinances there, so I'm going to ask Gary to close this out, and I'll go out and uh, meet our guests. Amen. Stand with us, we'll close the service with a prayer. We do thankful for this word this morning, and uh, even the songs of casting down our idols, and uh, calling upon the Lord. He who has clean hands and a pure heart will dwell with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. And we can come before you, Father. Your word says that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that, Father. That we can have clean hands and a pure heart, Father, just calling on you. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Just lift this day to you. In Jesus' name, amen.